Good evening. How are you? I am really happy to see you guys. I just want to, I want to say something to you. First of all, I love you guys. I am so glad you are here. Uh, you guys bring a, an excitement and a vibrance, uh, just a, a delight to this campus that we desperately need. And I just was, I want to say thanks. You're fantastic. And I'm so glad the Lord led you here. And I'm especially glad this semester, I'm getting to teach a class at Boys. They finally considered me good enough to teach on the faculty at Boys. So I, yeah, man. Putting it on my resume, hope I get a better job. Uh, I, I teach the great books. A seminar and really love it. I, I, we've got quite a right here. Cade sitting right here in the middle, front in the in the spit zone, man, right here. So I, I I love the students. They're in great books, and in fact, in honor of those guys, I want to do something a little literary tonight. I want you to turn to the book of Jonah. We're going to read chapter four. Refer to the whole book. You know the story of Jonah. At least you know the first three chapters pretty well because. Uh, you know, if you ever had a children's book about the book of Jonah, it probably covered the first three chapters. But the whole point of the book is chapter four. It's what I call a zone of turbulence. It, it takes you where you're not expecting to go. Read with me beginning in verse one of Jonah four. The end of chapter three says, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to the Ninevites and he did not do it, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was angry a and he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me for it's better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Well, Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city. He made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceeding glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it's better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who don't know their right hand from their left and even much cattle. There's not another chapter like that in the entire Old Testament. In fact, I don't think there's another ending to a story like that anywhere in all of world literature. And I'll tell you why. The problem with the book of Jonah is that Jonah, assuming he's the author, never read Aristotle because Aristotle tells you how to make a story. 
And whatever you watch, if you read a, a, a novel, if you read a short story, if you watch a movie, it pretty much follows the exact pattern that Aristotle talked about long time ago in his book uh, on drama and poetry because he analyzed what the Greek playwrights like Aeschylus and Euripides and those guys did. And he, he said, well, certain things have to happen. First of all, this is, you might want to write this down. This is profound. He says, it needs a beginning, a middle, and an end. And uh, what happens is that there has to be a logical sequence of events. It, it, it begins with what Aristotle calls stasis. In other words, things are normal, but then suddenly trouble comes. There's some event, there's some problem that causes conflict. And so then you, there's an effort made to resolve this conflict, whether it's between people or entities, or maybe it's even internal, but there's this trouble that has come into the scene and now you've got to resolve the conflict, but the trouble gets worse. The conflict, the, the, the tension gets ratcheted up. You want to make it even more uh, frightening or terrifying or puzzling or depressing, whatever emotion you're seeking, you want to ratchet it up and then comes resolution. So it doesn't matter if it's a comedy or if it's a tragedy, that's pretty much the way it follows. So if it's Lucy Ricardo trying to figure out how to make money to have a, a new, new furniture and she gets a job at a bakery and she can't keep up with the assembly line and she gets in all kinds of trouble uh, and then it gets resolved and she finally gets the money and gets the new furniture. Or if it's Wonder Woman trying to save the world from nuclear disaster and, and then she's got all the problems she, and she almost gets called and Superman gets, he, you know, as he's trying to solve the problem, he has to face the kryptonite and it gets, goes from bad to worse, but then you have resolution. There comes an end. There's some catharsis. There's some cleansing of the emotions. There's some resolution that says, oh, he got it, or, or, or else it's a tragedy. And, and you know, it can't be solved, but it still comes to an end. But that's not the way Jonah works. It starts that way. It starts well enough. I mean, here's Jonah minding his own business, and suddenly here comes trouble in the form of God. God says, Jonah, go to Nineveh. Now here's the problem. Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh because the Ninevites are going to oppress Israel. He knows it. He's a prophet. He sees it coming. He knows that within the next, within the next few generations, they're going to attack and they're going to cause a lot of death and destruction. And he doesn't want to have anything to do with them. And so what does he do? He goes and you see the progress all the way in the book of, of uh, Jonah in chapter one. He's going down. There's this downward progression. It's the peril of a person denying his purpose. When God said, go to these hated Ninevites, Jonah goes the other way. He goes down to Tarshish. He goes down to a ship. He goes down in the ship. He goes down in the water. He goes down in the fish, down in the grave. You see that word down, down, down over and over and over. And so here's Jonah. He's, he, when he gets into the storm and he confesses, look, this is all my fault. This is God's judgment on me because I'm disobedient. And you know, the, it's always stunning to me that the, the pagan sailors care more about life than Jonah does. Like they don't want to throw him overboard, but he tells them, no, it's the only way you're going to survive. So reluctantly they do it. They care more about him than he does about people. And then he gets swallowed by the fish. And then chapter two is Jonah's prayer from the belly of this great fish. It's the praise of a sinner delivered from his problems. There in the belly of the fish, he confesses to God that, you know, you're, you're the Lord. You have the right to tell me what to do. And finally, he concludes the chapter with that simple line, salvation belongs to the Lord. It's like he's gone down into the belly of the fish, down into the grave itself, and he describes it as death. I, I tend to think Jonah actually died. 
Whether he died or not, God brought him back to life or God sustained him miraculously for three days in the belly of the whale. Either way, Jesus used it as a sign of the resurrection, didn't he? He said, there's no sign gonna be given this generation except the sign of Jonah. And we see in Jonah a foreshadowing of the resurrection, three days, three nights in the belly of the, of the whale, of this great fish. And then he cries out to the Lord, God revives him spares him. He goes up on the land and he heads to Nineveh and chapter three, the preaching of a prophet who's been driven by his punishment. And he goes through Nineveh preaching the judgment of God. There's not a word about repentance. He just says, the Lord's going to judge you. Destruction is coming. Get ready. And you know, I like to think about what Jonah looked like. I mean, this guy had been in the stomach acids of a big whale for three days and three nights. It would have taken all the hair off of his body, would have bleached his skin, scarred him. I I think when a guy looking like that walks through your town saying the judgment of God is coming, you listen. They listen and they repented. The king proclaims repentance. They, They have a fast. They even make the cows fast. And God relents of the disaster that he said he was going to bring upon them. And Jonah gets mad. Now that's not like any other story you've ever seen because it, it, it doesn't make sense. We, we thought we had the resolution when they repented. Everything turned out good. The tension was released, but Then you got this weird scene tacked onto the end of it where Jonah goes up on the hillside just to watch and see what's happened. And listen to him cry out to God. Oh, he's full of pity. And he says, I knew you were going to do this. I knew, I knew you. This is why I didn't want to go all the way back there in my own country. I knew you're a God who is slow to anger and forgiving and very merciful and you will relent of the disaster. I knew it and Lord, you are acting just like your character and I don't like it. Just go ahead and kill me. And God asked him, do you do well to be angry? Now see, this isn't isn't the way a story's supposed to end. This is where Jonah takes such a radical turn. I mean. When we read books or see movies, we, we like to see the character come to some sense of revelation. He understands something. Uh, you know, if you, it's soon be Christmas, every year I gotta watch every version of the Christmas, a Christmas Carol that comes out. Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol, I, it's one of the greatest stories ever written. I don't care if it's Mr. Magoo, or Bill Murray, or whoever's playing Scrooge, I wanna watch it. I'm all about Scrooge, because what happens? He starts out one way, then this series of events happens through the night. The ghost of Christmas past and present and future, and it changes him. At the end, he's a different guy. That's what we want, that's what we're looking for. And and whether it's Ebenezer Scrooge, uh, or if you watch Groundhog Day, Bill Murray gets stuck in that time loop and it's the same day over and over and over until what? Until he he no longer cares about himself. He starts using that one day to care about other people. Then suddenly he gets out of it. It's the next day he can can move on. Uh, In Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities, the main character, Sidney Carton, he's not a very good guy. But at the end, he gives his life for his lookalike. He says, it's a far, far better thing I do than I've ever done. It's a far better rest that I go to than I have ever known. Now that's what I want to see with Jonah. I want to see him come to the place where he goes, oh, now I get it. God, you're wonderful. You're merciful. Thank you for showing mercy to these these people. But that's not what happens. God shows mercy and Jonah, the guy we thought had repented, the guy who did finally obey the Lord, now is angry at God for what he did. Uh, we, we don't want him to get mad at God, but this is precisely what he does. Much to our dismay, Jonah is 
showing us what our own fear is. Because I think our fear is that God will use us. And what that means is we cannot use him. You know, we, we want God to be the God who's there to make us well or wealthy or happy or in love. We really don't want God to use us to show the sufferings of Christ to the world or to enlarge his kingdom beyond the borders of our own comfort and familiarity. Another way to look at the story of Jonah is it's just exactly like the story of the prodigal son. But Jonah plays both characters. He's the prodigal that has to wake up and realize he can't do this on his own. But he's also the older brother who gets mad at the father for showing mercy and forgiveness. See, this is God showing us what our hearts look like. The danger of the human heart is that God tells us what to do and we say no. Or we say not them, or we say not now, or we say, oh, it's not really necessary. Or when God takes the thing we love, we say, not this. So Jonah goes and preaches. The people of Nineveh repent. And even though God said he was going to judge them, he relents and spares them. Now, this brings up a theological issue. It's like, well, does God change his mind? Uh, the Bible says God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not a man that he should change his mind or lie. But you often see that God is teaching us something about who he is by expressing one aspect of his character and his will and then showing us another. And I would just point out that Jonah knows God doesn't change his mind because Jonah knew from the very beginning exactly what God was going to do. He said, I know this is who you are. I knew you would do this because that is your character. God would be right to judge the people of Nineveh and ultimately God did judge the people of Nineveh, just not then. And he relented and he spared them. And when he did that, God showed us not only Jonah's heart, but he showed us his. That God cares more about relationship than retribution. He cares more about repentance than regret. He cares more about forgiveness than judgment. I mean, he could have just left the people of Nineveh to themselves. He didn't have to send a prophet. He didn't have to give them an opportunity. He would have been completely justified to let them die in their sin. But he didn't. He sent Jonah. And Jonah goes and they hear the message of God's judgment and that drives them to repentance and God spares them. And then the, Jonah, the story of Jonah is different from anything else any ending of any story I've ever read. Because just when we think we've seen the reversal in this main character, the recognition we thought we got in chapter two proves to be only fool's gold, a mirage, just smoke and mirrors. This guy really didn't repent. He, he merely acquiesced. He did what God made him do But Jonah isn't happy with God's forgiveness because he doesn't want to spend eternity with those kind of people. So he just goes up on the hillside overlooking the plain of Nineveh, fixes him a place to watch there. And he's waiting to see maybe the people's repentance won't be real. Maybe God will destroy them. He's going to wait and see, and he's pouting, and he's complaining to God, and he's so angry with God that he says, just go ahead and kill me. Just, just, just let me die. And he finds a place to wait for God's judgment or mercy, whichever one shows up. And he's definitely hoping it's God's judgment. I look at Jonah, and I find far more of myself there than I want to. 
because he shows the danger of what you and I would call a Christian heart, that we can value conscience, internal conscience, more than external revelation. Jonah was trusting his own sense of what should happen more than God's sense of what he was going to do. He was valuing comfort over calling. He was loving the temporary more than the eternal. And yet, how different from God? Because while Jonah is angry with the people of Nineveh and he wants them to be destroyed, God loves them enough to send them a prophet. And he loves the prophet enough to send a whale. And he, he loves the pouting prophet enough to send him a vine. Did, did you notice that? So John, God's not through with Jonah. Jonah's parked up there on the hillside watching over Nineveh and God wants to teach him something. So while Jonah is there in that near Eastern heat watching what's gonna happen to Nineveh, the sun beating down on him, God miraculously calls, uh, causes a vine. The King James Version, I remember, calls this a gourd. But it's some big plant that comes over him and it gives him shade. And then Jonah does a crazy thing. He sort of, he falls in love with the plant. It's like he puts his affection on this plant. Oh, look at this. What a wonderful thing, this plant has given me shade. And he actually feels more gratitude to the plant than he does to God. And the Lord allows his plant to come up over him, this vine, and gives him shade. And boy, Jonah, this is the first thing that's made him happy in a long, long time. This is better than the belly of a big fish. It's better than walking through Nineveh with people staring at you while you warn them of judgment. He's, he can take it easy here and watch what happens. But man, he loves his vine. And then God appoints a worm. God appoints a wind. God destroys the plant overnight. And the thing that Jonah loved is now taken from him and he pouts all over again. And once again, he asks God to let him die. Now, this doesn't fit Aristotle's plan at all. This isn't a very satisfying end to the story. And there's nothing cathartic about the vine. I don't feel cleansed and uplifted at all by this ending. In fact, uh, I sort of want to, I feel angry at Jonah and judge him for his self-centeredness. And then I realize that the Holy Spirit has done that to me on purpose because what he's really doing is exposing to me how easily I can judge someone else. It's easy for me to sit in judgment on Jonah until I realize that I'm just like him. That I desperately want to make it about me. And the silly things that I love and value. I want to warn you, you can be compliant in your actions and defiant in your attitude. You can be obedient to God's commands, but opposed to his mission. You can be submissive in your body, but self-righteous in your spirit. You can claim to carry his message, but completely miss his mission. You can represent his word, even though you reject his way. You can respond to God's call and totally miss his heart. In fact, a Christian college is probably about the easiest place in the world to do that. Because after all, you came here. Isn't that enough? Doesn't that really show you want to serve the Lord? You want to be faithful? You want to answer God's call? You care about the right things. You care about human trafficking. And you're against racism. And all kinds of oppression. Here's my question. 
What if God sends you to reach the human traffickers or the racist or the sexual abusers? It's easy for us to identify with the oppressed. But you know, there's a verse in Ecclesiastes that says, I, I saw those who were oppressed and there was no one to comfort them. But I also saw the oppressors and there was no one to comfort them. God cares about the oppressors as much as he does the oppressed. And I find myself like Jonah, wanting to approve whom God saves. And I certainly want to have a say in to where he sends me. I mean, I don't want him sending me to people I don't really want to spend eternity with. I, I find myself like Jonah or James and John wanting to call fire down from heaven on those people. I, I, I want to tell God, Lord, they deserve your judgment. They've done awful things, wicked things. But God cares about them too. It's not like there's hell number one for the sort of bad people and hell number two for the really bad people. There's just hell. There's just saved and lost. There's just heaven and hell. There's just our own deeds and the righteousness of Christ. And that's the thing. God didn't just send a prophet, he sent his son. Jesus didn't merely do the will of God, he delighted to do the will of God. How different than Jonah or me Jesus faced the volatile storm of God's wrath for a rebellion in which he did not participate. And he was cast out of the ship of humanity into the vast ocean of death itself. Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, even as Jonah was in the belly of the whale. And rising from that grave, Jesus preached the good news that whoever would understand his own brokenness and repent of sin and believe in him, would, he would save them. And that is the message of the cross. That is the purpose of the resurrection. And he sends us into all the world. We don't, we don't get to pick and choose. We don't get a say in those on whom God will have his mercy. He says, go. Share the gospel with everyone. Go to every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. You don't get to judge them. You just go and love them like I love them. And here at the very end of Jonah, it's unlike any other book in the Old Testament because Jonah feels so justified in his self-righteousness and his hatred of the Ninevites and his anger at God. And he even feels justified for his love of and sorrow over a stupid little plant. Yes, I do well to be angry. Now just go ahead and kill me. And God says to Jonah, now think about this, Jonah. You pity a plant that you didn't make. but I made the Ninevites. That plant grew up and lived and died in a day. But I've been watching them every day of their lives. And if you pity that plant, should I not pity Nineveh, the great city, that is so great. There are 120,000 people in that city who don't even have enough sense to discern their right from their left. Little children, people with diminished mental capacity. Don't you know, Jonah, if I destroyed that wicked city, I'd destroy them too. 
And then God says the most curious thing of all. And a lot of cows too. Well, I didn't see that coming. Why does God say that? Because he wants Jonah to know that he cares more about the cows than Jonah cares about eternal souls. You see, throughout the Old Testament, you get glimpses of God's heart. We see God's righteousness at the forbidding door of Eden when he posts angels there with swords of, of fire, but we don't see his heart. We see God's holiness in the smoke and thunder of Sinai, but not his heart. We see his justice in the slaughter of the Passover lamb, but we don't see his heart. But here in this intimate conversation with his prophet, it's like God rips open his chest and says, look, this is my heart. I care even about the wicked people of Nineveh whom you despise. I even care about their cows. I care about their babies. I care about the people who don't even know their right hand from their left. Can you care about people the way God cares about people? Can you say, Lord, protect me from being outwardly obedient and inwardly rebellious? Lord, would you keep me from a self-righteousness that judges whether or not people deserve your gospel? Lord, will you help me go wherever you send? Share the gospel with whomever you bring into my life? Father, my prayer is that we, like Jonah, will see the naked, bleeding, raw heart of God calling us, sending us, compelling us to go. Lord, protect us of a self-righteous spirit that is content with outward obedience while hiding a rebellious spirit. Protect us, Lord, from judging ourselves faithful while judging others unworthy of your grace. And may our hearts break for what your heart breaks for. And may we not only go, may we rejoice when you save. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.